and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. Now you will hear the recording for section two. Michael has some trouble at university. Professor Plant is having a talk with him in his office. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Come in, come in. Good morning, Professor Plant. I understand you wanted to see me. Yes, Michael, I did. It's about your coursework. My coursework? I'm afraid your tutor, Mr. Atkins, has reported to me that your standard of your work has been getting worse. I know, uh, Professor, I... He tells me that the essays you have done this term have been weak and that your attendance at his tutorials and seminars has been poor. He has spoken to me about it, Professor. At this stage, Michael, your coursework is very important. I understand from Mr. Atkins that you are capable of an upper second and it would be a pity to ruin your chances of a good degree, wouldn't it? Yes, it would. Michael, I think you should do two things. The first is to cut down on your union activities. I understand you do a lot in the student union. And the second is to see one of our welfare tutors to discuss any problems you may have. I'd like you to make an appointment to do that as soon as possible. All right, Professor. I'll expect to hear that your coursework has improved. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Professor, and thank you. Michael is in the welfare office. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. I hope I'm not late, Miss Baxter. I have an appointment for 11 o'clock. Professor Plant asked me to come. Take a seat, please. My name's Michael Andrews. I'm in my last year. Oh, yes. You're chairman of the Social Science Society, aren't you? That's right. That's one of my problems. It's been taking up too much time. Surely there must be another student who could take over the job. Yes, there is someone, I suppose. There isn't anything else worrying you, is there, Mr. Andrews? Anything personal, I mean? At home? Financial? You needn't feel embarrassed. There may be something I can do to help. I, er, uh, I'm in debt. Surely you have a reasonable grant. Yes, I have, but this terms hasn't come yet, and I borrowed some money when I bought a car. I see. Now this person, well, actually he's a friend. Now he wants his money back. That seems natural enough. How much do you owe him? One hundred pounds. Well, I'm afraid it, it's against our policy to lend money to students. The only solution seems to be to sell the car. Otherwise, you'll be short of money all term. Yes, I suppose so. In any case, I'll ask your county to send your grant as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Michael is talking to his friend Tessa in the student's coffee bar. Cheer up, Mike. You look really down in the dumps. What's the matter? I've seen the professor this morning and the welfare tutor. They've advised me to resign as chairman of the Social Science Society. Resign? But you've done it so well. Yes, I know. But I can't get through my work, and I've got finals coming up. I intended to work really hard last vacation, but you know what happened. I suppose it is best to resign, Mike. Peter can take over. That's not all. There's a bigger blow. Money, I suppose. Well, I owe Jim a hundred pounds. What for? The car, was it? You are a fool, Mike. I can't see how an economist can be so silly about money. I'll just have to sell the car. 
Well, cheer up. You can always use my bike. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 2. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Mark has talked about a small animal. I'm going to give you a talk about a very big one. It's the giraffe, a tall, long-necked, spotted ruminant. Male giraffes are usually about 6 metres tall. Half of the giraffe's height comes from its neck, which is longer than its legs. A baby giraffe is 2 metres tall at birth. It can stand up by itself within a few minutes and can run well in about two days. A giraffe has big brown eyes which are protected by very thick lashes. Since it lives in parts of Africa which are usually dry with a great deal of dust, the lashes are an important source of protection. It can also cover its nostrils in order to protect its nose. It has two short horns on its head. Like the camel, the giraffe can go a long time without drinking water. One source of water is the leaves which the giraffe eats from trees. Since it is so tall, the giraffe can reach the tender leaves at the top of a tree. Giraffes usually live in small herds and often feed with other animals. Giraffes have two methods of self-protection. If something frightens an adult giraffe, it can gallop away at about 50 kilometers per hour or stay to fight with its strong legs. Well, that's all I know about giraffes. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Peter and Kate have met in the coffee bar and they are having coffee together. Hi there, how are you going with your tutorial next week? Oh good, I've decided to talk about paper and its use. Fascinating, I'm sure. Yes, I think it's an interesting topic. Do you know how much paper you use every year? Well, I've never thought about that. I can't answer your question. I suppose you can tell me something about it. OK. It'll be good practice for my tutorial next week. How much paper does one person use every year? In 1900, the world's use of paper was about one kilogram for each person in a year. Now, some countries use as much as 50 kilograms of paper for each person in a year. This shows how far advanced the country is. You're right. Countries like the United States, Britain, Japan, Germany and Sweden certainly use more paper than other countries. I'm very interested in the history of paper. Are you going to talk about it next week? Yes, of course. Where was paper first made? In China. The Chinese first made paper about 2,000 years ago. China still has pieces of paper which were made as long ago as that. But Chinese paper was not made from the wood of trees. It was made from the hair-like parts of certain plants. In Egypt and the West, paper was not very commonly used before the year 1400. The Egyptians wrote on papyrus, a kind of paper made from the pith of the stems of tall aquatic cyberitious plants. Europeans used parchment for many hundreds of years. What was parchment? Parchment was made from the skin of certain young animals. They were very strong 
We have learnt some of the most important facts of European history from records that were kept on parchment. Oh, I see. How about paper in Europe? Well, paper was not made in southern Europe until about the year 1100. Scandinavia, which now makes a great deal of the world's paper, but didn't begin to make it until 1500. It was a German named Schraffler who found out that the best paper could be made from trees. After that, Canada, Sweden, Norway, Finland and the United States became the most important in paper making. They are forest countries. Today, Finland makes the best paper in the world and the paper industry of the country is the biggest in the world. New paper making machines are very big and they make paper very fast. The biggest machines can make a piece of paper 300 metres long and 6 metres wide in one minute. Oh my goodness, that's amusing. What are the uses of paper? Paper is used for newspapers, books, writing paper, envelopes, wrapping paper, paper bags. Yes, only half of the paper that is made is used for books and newspapers. Have you got an idea about other uses of paper? No, I'm afraid not. There are many other uses. Paper is very good for keeping you warm. Houses are often insulated with paper. You have perhaps seen homeless people asleep on a large number of newspapers. Yes, I have. So they're insulating themselves against the cold. You are right. In Finland, it is very cold in winter. It is sometimes 40 degrees below zero centigrade. The farmers wear paper boots in the snow. Nothing could be warmer. Oh, that's unbelievable. Now more and more things are made of paper. We have had paper plates, cups and dishes for a long time. But now we hear that chairs, tables and even beds can be made of paper. With paper boots and shoes, you can wear paper hats, paper dresses and paper raincoats. When you have used them once, you throw them away and buy new ones. You know, the latest in paper seems to be paper houses. These are not small houses for children to play in, but real, big houses for people to live in. You can put one up yourself in a few hours and you can use it for about five years. Fascinating. People have made paper boats, but they have not yet made paper planes or cars. Just wait, they probably will. Well, I'm sure your tutorial will go really well. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three. In this section, you will hear two talks about London's parks and some interesting places. Look at the forms and fill the missing information in the correct boxes. Look at questions 21 to 33. Note the examples that have been done for you. Now listen to the first talk and answer questions 21 to 25. Here are some figures for the number of tourists visiting the Royal Parks. The Royal Parks are the property of the Crown and were originally the grounds of Royal Homes or Palaces. In central London, these include Hyde Park, originally a hunting forest belonging to Henry VIII. It now consists of 340 acres of trees and grass intersected by paths, with boating and swimming on the Serpentine Lake, and horse riding in Rotten Row. Hyde Park is one of the most popular attractions. In 1990, almost 20,000 people visited the park. Kensington Gardens are formal gardens covering 274 acres and containing Kensington Palace. There you can visit the Round Pond, the Albert Memorial, and a statue of Peter Pan, the famous fairy tale figure created by Barry. About 10,000 people visited the park in 1990. Regent's Park was also part of Henry VIII's hunting forest in the 16th century. Today it contains the London Zoo, a boating lake, the Regent's Canal and an open-air theatre. It is one of the most popular attractions with over 25,000 visitors each year. 
The number of visitors to Regent's Park increased after a children's zoo was opened, resulting in a sharp rise from 25,000 to 32,000 in 1990. Now listen to the second talk and answer questions 26 to 33. Tick the relevant boxes in each column. First, look at questions 26 to 33. Now listen to the second talk and answer questions 26 to 33. There is so much to see and do in London. It's hard to know where to start, so in order to help you, we've listed the major attractions, places of interest and museums in Inner London. If it's open to the public, tick in the table. If not, make a cross in the correct column. The Barbican Centre is a very good place to visit. It has excellent facilities for a wide range of cultural activities, all under one roof. Concerts, plays, art exhibitions and films. Home of the world-famous London Symphony Orchestra and the Royal Shakespeare Company, it also offers informal events and performances at lunchtime, early evening and at weekends. It is open from 9 o'clock in the morning until 11 o'clock at night. Mondays to Saturdays from noon to 11 p.m. Sundays and public holidays. For performances, telephone 01-6384-141, extension 218. The underground stations are Moorgate and Barbican. Madame Tussauds is the place where wax figures of famous and infamous people can be found. It is open daily from 9 a.m., to 5.30 p.m., including weekends. The underground station is Baker Street. St. James's Palace is at the corner of St. James's Street and Paul Mall. It is a royal palace within walking distance of Piccadilly Circus and is not open to the public. The chapel is open to the public for the Sunday morning service at 11.15. You can get off at Green Park Underground Station. The Museum of London illustrates the history and topography of London from prehistoric times to the present day. Admission is free. Opening times Tuesdays to Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Sundays 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. You can get off at St. Paul's Barbican and Moorgate Underground stations. Buckingham Palace is the London home of the Queen. When the Queen is in residence, the Royal Standard is flown from the flagstaff. It is generally not open to the public. However, visitors are admitted to the Queen's Gallery. The underground stations are Victoria, St. James's Park and Green Park. You are welcome to London and we hope you have an enjoyable time here. Thank you. That's the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear a talk about soil. Look at questions 34 to 42. Now listen to the talk and answer questions 34 to 42. Hello and welcome to today's lecture. Today we turn our attention to the soil. As you know, soil is made up of stones, sand, clay and loam. It also contains air and water. Stones are small pieces of rock. They are larger than the other parts of soil. The stones in the soil are of all shapes and sizes. When stones break up, 
they form grains of sand. The soil on the beach is mainly made up of sand. Since the grains of sand are quite big, there are many large spaces between them. Air is found in most of these spaces. Sometimes water too is found in these spaces, but water can run through these spaces very quickly. When water runs through, the sand becomes dry again. If you pick up some sand between your thumb and your forefinger, you can feel the size of the grains. Clay is made up of very small grains or particles. These particles are so small that we can hardly see them. They lie very close to each other. The spaces between them are very small. They do not contain much air. If you pick up some dry clay, it feels powdery. Wet clay is sticky and dries very slowly. This is because water does not run through it quickly. Clay holds the water back. Loam is a mixture of clay and sand. It also contains hummus. Hummus is made up of pieces of dead animals and plants. Loam is the best type of soil because it contains air, water and hummus. Hummus is important for plant growth. It also has many types of salts. Plants use these salts for making food. Loam does not become as dry as sand or as wet as clay. The soil in most gardens is made up of loam. Besides of these things, soil also contains living things. Plants live on the surface of the soil, but their roots are found in the soil. Animals live on the surface of the soil and inside it. Now let us talk about the life in the soil. When you look at the soil in your garden, you may think that there is no life in the soil, but you are wrong. If you examine the soil closely, you will find that there are living things in it. There are many types of animals and plants living in the soil. Some plants and animals living in the soil are so small that we cannot see them. Because of this, we say they are microscopic. Germs, or microbes, are microscopic forms of life. Many germs live in the soil. Some of these germs can cause diseases. Others are useful because they live on dead animals and plants. Besides germs, there are other thread-like plants called algae living in the soil. Microscopic animals called protozoans are also found in the soil. There are many insects living in the soil. Some of them, like white ants and mole crickets, live in the soil throughout their lives. Others only live in the soil when they are adults. Insects, like grasshoppers, dig holes in the soil and lay their eggs in these holes. Many types of ants live in the soil. Some insects, which dig into the soil, have legs which are specially made for digging. The mole cricket is such an insect. Most of the insects living in the soil eat dead plant parts, like dried leaves. Loam is the best soil for them because it contains a lot of dead plant parts. Other animals, like centipedes, scorpions and millipedes, also live in the soil. Centipedes and scorpions live on other small animals, which they kill with their poison. Millipedes live on dead plant remains. All three types of animals are very useful to plant life. Many different types of worms live in the soil. They are earthworms roundworms, sandworms and flatworms, rats, moles and rabbits are animals which they make their homes in the soil also. We'll discuss these animals in our next talk. Thank you. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.